Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb Nauer, and we're joined here with Tassos Alexu. What's going on, my man? What's happening, Caleb? How are you today? Good, good. Living a life. Um, kind of bummed out because I got to go to the dentist here in a little bit and have them yell at me with the, uh, the myth of flossing. So we'll get, <laughs> we'll get into that shortly. But made up by the fact that it is 70 sunny and uh, we might get up to a little cooking tonight. We'll see how things go. So I'm, I'm about fitty, 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 fitty. So <laughs> yeah, ho- hopefully this podcast is not on dental hygiene and flossing. Yeah, yeah. There's some things I'm really good at, and some things we probably don't want to get too, too, too deep into. So, yeah. Cool, man. So, this week, I thought what we would talk about are some myths, misconceptions, and misunderstandings that are common in the WISP industry that we see a lot. Um, honestly, I'm just happy I got through that. <laughs> Didn't completely fumble it, but... It's a tongue twister. It is, it is. So... We see a lot of these pop up, and maybe what we'll do is maybe like a little series of these, or as they come up, we'll come and revisit some of them or something like that, but thought it would be good to give our insight into some of these and give people some good info, so... I think one of your favorite ones that you've talked about, especially to us, you know, internally is the whole myth of more gain equals more better. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people's answer is like, I need the biggest antenna. I got to have the most gain, but in the real world doesn't always work out like that. So I thought I'd throw you that softball to start running with here. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few things. So obviously gain is extremely important, right? There's this thing called link budget. So yeah, you definitely have to have enough gain to satisfy and balance out that link budget equation. That's the first step. Now we know that there's a lot of variables out there, right? Uh, in the world that can change this link budget calculation. Cause it's not static. It's not just point A to point B there's environmental issues. There's noise issues. So, I mean, typically, yes, you do want you know more gain than what the link budget says because you know it does rain it does snow you can't always overcome you know those completely but it's it's good to buffer your link budget just a little bit but the 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 key here is you know not to just use ungodly amounts of gain just because. I think that's really the the main point we're trying to throw out there. I mean, I see people on the forums all the time saying, yeah, I'm doing a one mile link and you know, just use 34 DBI dishes, right? And it's just, <laughs> that kind of generic thing is just, is just not good. I mean, cause you, you also can, you know, overdrive, right? The radios themselves. So radios don't like super, super hot signals, uh, especially at these uh, higher modulation rates. You definitely need more signal the higher you go modulation rate. But I mean, to just kill it with gain, it's definitely not uh, more better <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, stick with the calculation, figure out what you need physically for that link. You can add uh, a few DBI, uh, you know, obviously to kind of buffer it for rain fade and, and other potential problems. Uh, and it's best to have a more balanced network where the, the radio is happy with the receive signal and everything else just stays in tune from there. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to, to run that link calculator. You know, we beat this drum all the time. Link calculator, link calculator, you know, pay attention to it. And it, it really matters because, like I said, you don't want to overdrive it. You don't want to overpay, you know. Like, why do you want to pay for, you know, the highest gain antenna you can got where something simple, something smaller, especially smaller footprint, you know, your small symmetricals and stuff for your micro pops. You know, there's no need to put the absolute biggest antenna that you need on there where you can get by just fine with, you know, something lower gain. Also not picking up the noise from eight miles away, which is super important as well. Yeah. I think that's another kind of like misconception on that as well, right? Because people say, well, I could use more gain, but I could just turn down the power. And and you're right. Obviously you can, but you can't turn down the receive gain of that higher dish. So even if you turn down your overall TX power, again, you know, on the receiving side of that, uh, you're going to get a much hotter signal because again, you know, you, if you have 34 dBi for antenna gain, that that's how much, you know, intensity you're going to receive. So you can't really tune both sides down. Um, obviously, you know, adjusting your TX power appropriately, staying within EIRP limits. That's another thing you have to think about, which I think a lot of people <laughs> don't do sometimes, but EIRP know. limits, what's that? I mean, you just turn everything up all the way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Full power. <laughs> Full power. So I remember the first little link I did where I just, it was a super short and I forget the details, but like the, the receive signal came in at like a neg 23 or something crazy <laughs> like that. And I'm like, man, this link's going to run great. And it didn't run with the 
flip because I was just completely overloading the receiver. So we see that one quite a bit as people are in the learning curve for sure. Yep. So cool, cool. Uh, another one that someone threw out there. Uh, let's see. Oh, two four is dead. Uh, the death of two four. We've been hearing about the death of two four since the launch of two four. I think <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly not as popular, you know, when we first started doing this years and years ago, or 24 DBI dishes on, you know, on 2.4 shooting 10 miles to an Omni. And you could, because I mean, there was no noise, there was no competition, and you were happy with, you had 500K, that thing was maxing out that, but, you know, you were happy with that. Now, of course, you know, with the advent of just so much more noise and competition and the wireless routers in people's houses and stuff, that, that band got trashed out a bit. But honestly, I think it's making kind of like a retro resurgence, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know, bell-bottom jeans or something like that. You know, these things are sort of cyclical. So definitely seen a lot more. <laughs> yeah, bell bottoms. They actually do if you kind of flip it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My yeah. Halloween costume for this year, yeah. so... But yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of people talking about two four a lot. I thought we kind of talk about that and just you know let folks know it ain't dead. Yeah, no, I think really the you know from my perspective, you know, the death I would say is really the support for two point four gigahertz, and uh, you know, manufacturers, uh, you know. Uh, I guess, you know, not really wanting to kind of push uh, that frequency band because of the limited spectrum, right? You only have, what, 60 megahertz of spectrum. So you have, you know, three non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels. So I, I wouldn't say the technology is dead. Obviously, like you said, um, you know, there's, there's, there was the noise floor that went through the roof. Um, and again, you know, the same thing happened with five gig, right? People say, oh, five gig is trash, but it took a new antenna technology like our horns to kind of come out, clean a lot of that up and make it a lot more efficient. So I think the same thing could happen with 2.4. Again, the methodology uh, on most of the deployments with 2.4 is again using omnis right uh, or extremely sloppy sectors maybe we can help in the future i mean our array sector does a really good job at suppressing some side lobes giving you some really good co-location capability because of the integrated back shield and stuff like that so i think it it, it could have another resurgence other than you know the fact that now most of your home routers are going to five gigs so all those 2.4 gigahertz home routers that were raising the noise floor in these deployments is now going down we're, we're seeing again a a you know like you said a resurgence of it and, and i think if we use it correctly this time around right um, for instance using it for those kind of near line of sight type situations where 2.4 gigahertz uh, attenuates better it could be a really low cost option for some people compared to let's say maybe moving to cbrs which is a a, a much higher cost uh, expense to kind of jump into the potential there for licensing and other things that's there so so i think there's definitely a place for 2.4 it's probably not going to be for your 100 meg 100 plus meg packages it'll be for your real rural real dense i think again we have to take it you know one step forward where it used to be one omni high gain omni on the top of a tower in a rural area you know let's let's go back to at least you know 2.4 gigahertz with four sectors uh, maybe running 10 megahertz channels to give you non-overlapping to give you some guard i mean there's a lot of tricks and techniques that that can be done to really effectively use 2.4 gigahertz in today's market and uh, get to some of these customers that uh, you couldn't get to before at a, a really effective price point yeah you know you don't want to call it necessarily a connection of last resort because it's definitely not that but you know these are cases where rural connections are spread out low density and we're, we're trying to clip through those last few trees that maybe your five jigs not cutting it especially once it gets rain on the leaves and stuff like that so yep. this is why we released the 2414 sector earlier this year we now have the 2417 which will be shipping yes. here soon which is pretty sweet. Um, refactored the uh, arrays in there, so we we're able to get it in the same form factor, or very, very, very similar form factor, which is pretty sweet. So really happy about the work we were able to get done on that. So that'll be out there soon. Uh, we've got a lot of demand for that, and we look forward to seeing your guys sort of crazy wackadoo shoot through the stuff we tell you not to shoot through connections. But you know, sometimes <laughs> you got to get it did. That's the yeah, only way to do yeah. it. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I mean, like I said, there's there's a lot of things that folks do that sometimes we, 
we kind of you know joke with and stuff like that and it's you know we understand at the end of the day you got to do what you got to do right not every every wisp has the same operating budget right so some people really have to operate on a shoestring budget and, and that's that's understandable um and like i said i i think you know what we try to do is to really just put out there what the real best methods are for these particular frequencies these types of radios you know what works best um in these types of situations, especially again, non-line of sight. I mean, that's my biggest pet peeve. You know, I, I understand that there's, you know, a lot of, you know, wireless technology out there that clearly works in non-line of sight, you know, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you should be able to do that or you should do that in every different frequency band that's out there. So some are better than others uh, and some could be utilized uh, better than others for that particular job. So in the end, you know, try and apply some of these techniques that we're doing, take into consideration some of the things that we're saying are best known methods try not to violate those methods as much as possible uh and you know you should get that the best user experience because in the end again that's 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 what we're looking for as an industry because if, if you start doing something that's totally off the wall and 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 really doesn't run well it really creates this negative perception of wisps and stuff like that and in the end we we really want that to take off i mean if everyone's scared about you know skynet and you know fart link out there you know with their satellite internet <laughs> offerings and stuff like that um you know we can see how the negative marketing for that can affect the markets we don't want that same type of negative thing coming towards the wisp industry we want to keep it clean we want to keep those services better it's okay if you're offering two or five meg packages that's cool but make it a freaking solid two or five meg connection make it something that's absolutely reliable and uh again that'll help us all in the long run yeah 100 percent. that reliability is such an important aspect of it because it's so easy to get caught up on prices and speeds and you know those sort yep. of peak numbers and stuff but if it's not reliable then none of it really matters so exactly also, thank you for placing that fart link time bomb in my head. So next time when this comes <laughs> up and I say that, I'm gonna be like, I get, get, get. So yeah, I, I have my like, you know, my hashtags, right? Like fake G is 5G, <laughs> fart link is, you know, <laughs> Starlink. And I'm sure I'll come up with some other ones later. Hmm, yeah, that might have burned getting Elon on the podcast. So it's just well, the risk we take on this sometimes. Bring it, man. That'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh recent conversation we just had the other day is some of the misunderstandings about how you do the channel planning on some of these big array towers that we set up so you know we're seeing more and more of these folks running 12 you know 18 sectors where you run 12 30s you're on 18 20s or you know you do one ring of that and you add another ring or you throw some ultra horns and stuff on top and people are like well, how do you channel plan for that you know what's what's the list and you know, it's easy to be like, well, in a totally, you know, greenfield environment with nothing else, you know, oh, just ABC or ABCD. So, but I mean, the real world's real and it's painful sometimes. And, you know, you've got to look at, you, you've got to do your spectrum analysis. You've got to look at each one of your sectors and sort of map out, build, build a chart, I would say, of, of what that is. So I don't know, what's your common experience uh, when you're talking to folks and talking about some of their initial channel plannings on these bigger arrays? Yeah. So again, yeah, every deployment's different, right? So, you know, some people can get away with ABAB, some go ABC, ABCD, you know, obviously um, it, it kind of depends. I think, you know, there's really, there's, there's two kind of uh, variables that you have to look at, right? So first off is, you know, how well, you know, are the APs co-located? That's the first part of, let's say, GPS sync being successful, right? So the AB, AB, or ABC uh, kind of channel planning really depends on, you know, when you reuse A, does the first A hear you or not, uh, or do you interfere with that? So that might be the case that it doesn't. Maybe everything is great. You're using our horns. You have good spatial diversity between the horns on the tower. So therefore, you can use only two channels and build a ring of 12. Let's just say that works. The, the thing that people often forget is that by the time you use a, let's say for the third time, maybe it's on the back back of the tower. Yeah, maybe the other APs that are on channel A don't hear that third one. So, you know, in theory, it should work. If that particular frequency is being used, you know, downrange by another tower and it's blasting frequency A right back at that horn or that particular antenna, you can't use it, right? So I think that's, that's the big thing is, you know, you really 
kind of have to see what your you know uh, what your deployment looks like so it might be a b it might be a b c or a c or something like that you might have to throw in that third fre frequency every now and then and you can try and reuse a again on the next the next runaround uh, based on what's available uh, downstream now when we start talking about you know building <clears throat> multiple rings which is very popular you have to start again uh, including some spatial diversity right you have to have space uh, maybe spatial diversity is the wrong word to use but you have to have space between the rings basically to create that isolation so i mean typically you build one ring and hopefully at least 10 feet below that ring, you can start building your second ring. And the way we try and do this when we, you know, try and explain it to a wisp that's doing it is you shouldn't have, let's say, A and A, you know, 10 feet apart, but one on top of each other. What the second ring should be pointing down the center of where, you know, the, the two horns come together, if that makes sense. So you have, you know, channel A here, channel B here, 10 feet down, it should be right in the middle. So you should be shooting down where the two patterns come together. You kind of build like a, a daisy, right? The way the petals of a daisy go, they don't go all in line. You have a ring and then it's offset for the next ring and it's offset for the next ring. So it, it gets pretty complicated. It's, it's very difficult to kind of explain it and not visualize it for people. But I think maybe you start to at least get the idea of how it's done. And again, you never know, you know what it's going to be like until you actually do it. So none of this stuff is textbook, just like you can't just go and trust the spec sheets, right? I mean, things just don't work like that in the real world. I mean, we, we give you the, the basic foundation of how these things work and the best known practices for doing it, but it doesn't always work out exactly like that. No, that's actually a really good point. And I think the the point of the misconceptions about, you know, how the horns work, especially in general with blocking out the noise. We, we hear this quite a bit too. They're like, hey, you know, I put up these horns in this really noisy environment and I'm, I'm still seeing a lot of noise. My modulation rates are dropping. I thought it just cut out all the noise. I'm like, yeah. well, I mean... Yes, it cuts out the back lobes, cuts out the side lobes, obviously. That's the point. That's, a, that's our whole gimmick behind what we're doing with these horns, right? But, you know, the noise, your unwanted signal that's not your carriers that you're you're trying to deal with that are in the main lobe, in that main service face of that antenna, you know, there's no magic bullet or panacea to get rid of that. And I think that's a really big misconception. And people are like, I don't have a channel plan. I just throw these up and they, they magically cut out of the noise. And unfortunately, that's not how physics works in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw that. I mean, just recently, right, Caleb, we were working with a customer and it's a really high noise environment. And, you know, we said, well, let's look at the spectrum scan. Right. So you saw like all this noise and you saw this opening down here and you saw all this noise over here. And for whatever reason, they, they wanted to operate where, you know, there was this high intensity. Right. And, and it's like, well, it, it's noisy, but the horn should work. It's like, yeah, but the horn is telling you that it sees all these frequencies being used down its bore sites. It can't tune that out. Right. But you have this whole chunk right here that's available. Why aren't you using that? Well, because we want to see it work in noise. It's like there's a difference between the ambient noise and the noise floor that comes up and actually, you know, physically used channels that are that are pointing right at your antenna. So, you know, that again, the, the noise isolation and the beauty of the horns is that when you put one out, you will find somewhere in the spectrum a usable channel, and that's the one you should be using, not to try and you know live within you know uh, a bunch of used channels that are pointing right at you. Yeah, and that's why these spec analysis are really important. And this is why we always try to stress: if you're new to the ecosystem, and you're like, "Well, I want to try this up," like we point out, "Hey, try these horns where you've already got an existing sector, right?" Do your spectrum analysis, take pictures, take notes, and everything else. Swap that antenna over to the horn, now compare it. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot less reds. You're going to see a lot more greens. You're going to see your waterfall densities decrease. You're going yep. to see gaps. Like a lot of times, you know, those hard sort of barriers where your channels will start to show up more blockier. Instead of just being one big blob, you'll start to see more of the focus on the channelized stuff, and you can get in there in those nulls and operate. So, you know, that, that before and after is, is the experience part of it like you've got to play around with a few the same as planning the frequency arrays on these or the frequency channels on these uh big arrays you know like until you get out there and do one of them and kind of see what it works out in the real world you know it's all just a paper exercise but you know these things come with experience and it's just a matter
matter of playing around with a little bit and you'll get it figured out. So don't fret, but don't go into it. Don't go boldly into the night with your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. What's, what else has come up interesting? Oh, the uh, the connectors on top. Mm-hmm. So, you actually explained this to me the other day, and I never actually thought about it this way. So, you know, it comes up well on the Twistport adapter with the SMA connectors. People are like, well, why is this connector on top? I want to go to the side and the bottom. Well, that's not how that Twistport is built. That Twistport is built so that one connector on top and then one connector to the right, and that unit actually has a weep hole in the bottom. So tiny little hole. So if you ever did pick up some moisture or, you know, condensation, you know, from rapid temp changes and stuff like that, it's got somewhere to go. So it's really important that you put that up, the labels up the right way. But we got into a conversation about how the connectors are more waterproof if they're on top with the way that works. So if you'll explain to the crowd kind of what you told me the other day, you did a really good job of it. Yeah, so it'd be kind of hard to visualize this. So if you look at you know this being the uh, the SMA with the thread, right? This is what's basically on the radio or the twist port adapter. If you think about the you know RP SMA, it's usually a barrel that kind of goes around uh, the actual thread itself. When it's facing up, it actually works better because when you when you seal with either cold shrink or mastic, whatever it is, water will run down the outside of the nut and then it comes and it touches the threads and it, and it drips down, right? Water actually gets into the connector, connector via the thread. So when your connector is facing down, again, the threads are here and this is the nut and the barrel's here, well, water is gonna get on the threads and then it'll start dripping down inside the threads into the connector and that's how you get your water and connector. So actually having it facing up is better than uh, having it facing down. I really honestly just wanted to make sure we got those visuals of you showing that on the video to uh, <laughs> like, like that. And yeah, you that turn was, it on. And you turn it on. <laughs> so, but no, that's a really important point. And I think we see this all the time. And I'm like, guys, if the connectors on top was a bad idea, all the radio manufacturers wouldn't be doing it. So, yeah. whether you're prisms or 3Ks or 3KLs or whatever. So, um, I mean, you know, Air Fiber 11's got end connectors on top and stuff. Yeah, for for a lot of the stuff, it's really out of convenience, right? So they're not, they're not. It's not always the best design. Doesn't mean it's the absolute worst, right? But I think there's some compromises that manufacturers make uh, based on that. And CBRS sectors are probably one of the best uh, uh, cases of this, right? So you know, you see a lot of CBRS sectors with the end connectors at the bottom of the actual patch array sector. And that's because it just makes sense. At the bottom, you screw it straight up, you can have your drip loop and it kind of goes up to the radio, whereas if you have it, you know, coming out the back, then it's going to be sideways and you have to have a weird bend and, and what have you. But really, when you look at antenna design, specifically patch array and, uh, t- uh, design, the connectors being in the middle of the array or closer to the middle of the array is actually more efficient and, and gives you uh, a better output from your antenna than having the feed lines at the bottom because then you have to have these large traces because it, it does, the patch array feeds into the center of the array, right? So you have a lot of parasitic uh, radiation or parasitic loss through these traces that create a lot of these side lobes and this near field uh, type, uh, you know, uh, antenna. Basically, it's like a long antenna that you're creating. So it's really not the best place to put it uh, for that particular reason. But again, manufacturers do it because it's convenient because maybe, you know, the user base says, well, it'd be a lot easier if it was at the bottom. So like, hey, let's just put it there rather than say, yeah, we can put it there, but we're not giving you the best antenna. So uh, you can see this in our, uh, you know, CBRS sector that we have. We have the connectors in the middle of the array where it's supposed to be to give you the best RF performance. And we've done some really cool stuff to help you with weatherproofing and stuff like that on it as well. So we make the best out of both worlds. Yeah, and that's a really slick setup. So all that stuff's online on the website now. So check it out. The little the little hat protector covers are pretty slick. So, but yeah, just in general, like as much people want to sweat connectors aside, top, bottom, whatever else. In the end, if you do a good job of weatherproofing them, then you're gonna be fine. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, right? So whether you're yeah. old school and run tape, mastic tape. Um, whether you're using cold shrink or some of this newer tech and stuff out there in the grand scheme of things, as long as you do a good quality job of sealing up your connectors, you typically don't have nothing to worry about anyways. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. 
And then to wrap it up here, uh, you know, we've talked about fiber several times in this. You know, I don't think we necessarily want to beat the beat the drum again on a lot of that. But one of the things that was brought up is, hey, you know, people are like, fiber is the best. The fiber is the only option. Fiber is the best option. And we've discussed in the past. No, it, it, it is, you know, it depends on a lot of things. So I mainly just want to sort of reiterate that the choice of fiber, whether you're deploying the business case as you as an operator or the demographics of where you're deploying, it's an extremely subjective thing, right? So like so many other things in our industry or in the world in general, everyone wants a black and white, you know, objective. This is this, right? But it's a gray world. And a lot of these things are super subjective and whether or not you're doing fiber and how you're doing it really is, it plays into that so much. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, I think the hybrid model is here to stay. And I think all WISP should be considering, you know, offering some sort of fiber connectivity when they can, uh, if they can, obviously. You know, I, I really think the whole fiber push has a lot to do with this kind of just, you know, general industry push for more and more bandwidth per customer. And a lot of it is just wasteful, right? There's a lot of government money out there. And therefore, you know, fiber has, you know, some of the highest guaranteed kind of speeds and latency and and uh is is able to again on paper deliver uh the you know what what the minimum requirement is to be categorized as uh you know as broadband right but i think wisps are you know able to do it with wireless faster right i mean obviously we have 60 gigahertz now uh, we're pushing you know multiple hundreds of megs which i still think is a lot for your average customer of course there's the very niche market of gamers that have to download a you know four or five gig you know a patch or update for their game and stuff like that but i mean that the typical wisp customer and I'm not a WISP. Again, I always have to say that, right? So <laughs> maybe there's some WISPs out there that can share some of that data with us. And I'd be interested to see what the breakdown is of, you know, you know, the, the type of services that are really hogging this bandwidth and really require it. And what percentage is that of your overall WISP customer base? And just shooting in the dark, I'm thinking 10%, right? Uh, probably not more than that. You know, the, the, you know, streaming some Netflix, streaming some YouTube videos on a downlink, we're talking dozens of megs. Uh, probably for the average household, you know, again, uh, there's always going to be the ones that, you know, are on the torrents and downloading constantly and doing some weird shit, but that's, that's not your typical user. It's not your typical user at all. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so fiber is great, right? Definitely get on board if you can, uh, it's, there's a place for it, but again, I, I think it's what's fueling the, the, the drive for fiber right now is this just overwhelming mismarketing of what users need as far as real deliverable bandwidth in order for, you know, the average household to operate in the modern world. Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, we were talking to some new folks and stuff at Wisp Palooza a couple of weeks ago and they're like, man, I don't should I even try doing this? You know, because you know, fiber this, fiber that. And I'm like, you know, talking about well, where are you located? Where are your demographics? What does your density look like? And you know, the realistic side of it is fiber is never going to make sense here. Now there's a lot of government money pushing a lot of it out there, but you know, those are only sort of slim areas and it's based on how good your congressman may be at, at getting that hand out there and getting all that free government money at play. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think the potential for new list deployments is probably as high, if not higher than has ever been, you know, so don't lose hope. Yeah. Fiber is awesome. If you can do it or do it where it makes sense and keep your wireless where it makes sense. You know, again, is such a subjective thing. And I think anyone that dictates there's only one answer here is misguiding at the least and just sort of downright dubious at the worst. So, yeah. Cool, cool, man. Well, I think we about hit our time this week. That was the, the top list of topics I just sort of grabbed from questions, but we're here to answer your questions. So, folks, you want to hear from us? Um, you want us to talk about some different topics, different areas? You want us to expound upon what we've been talking about, get into deeper details? Let us know. You know, anything you want us to hit? Let us know, and we'll do our best to get that done. You can find us on our social media sites, RFLMS English, RFLMS main page. We're all over Facebook, Wisp Talk, and those user groups. You can find us, Caleb, at RFLMS.com, Tassos at RFLMS.com. 
Uh, oh, call to action. We forgot to call people to action. Uh, yeah, I was just about to roll right into it, and then you said it. It was going to look, it was gonna look so smooth and natural the way I was going to be. Make sure you all like, listen, and subscribe to our YouTube channel or anywhere you download your podcast like Google, Spotify, or Apple. But until next time, I guess, stay horny. <laughs> stay horny, everybody. Stay horny, everybody.